Stand up. Hello, my friends. Welcome to another amazing episode of Stand Up, where I will be welcoming a listener as my guest. Listener turned guest happens from time to time. Really excited to get Dr. Will Judy on here. We've been talking about it for months now, and I finally got my act together, and Will is fantastic. I really enjoyed our conversation. He is an urgent care physician by day and a secular activist the rest of his time. He's actually the state director in Texas for the American Atheists, where he helps keep the secular groups in Texas healthy and active. He's the chair of the American Atheist Secular Advocacy Team. And he is in leadership of both Houston Oasis and Houston Atheists. And finally, he formed the group Secular Houston, which organizes the secular political voice in the greater Houston area, endorsing candidates and doing some really important organizing and activism. And he is the real deal. He stands up for what he believes in, and I think he's making really positive, progressive change, doing a lot of good in the world. I think you're going to love my conversation with Will. It begins at 27 minutes. Learn a lot more about him. Program. But first, as I do pretty much every Monday through Thursday, I've got your headlines and sound bites. So let's get started, shall we? Let's start with the big news that came out of the United Nations yesterday where the Security Council endorsed a U.S.-backed plan and voted 14 to 0 to strengthen the hand. This will strengthen the hand of Secretary of State Antony Blinken. He's returned to the Middle East for like his, I don't know how many trips he's been there, but he's there to press Hamas and Israel to agree to a ceasefire. But as the New York Times says, in a sign of difficulties facing Mr. Blinken and other mediators in achieving a final deal, Israel's representative Representative to the U.N. did not say that Israel had accepted the terms of the ceasefire plan. She said that her country's goals and war did not change and that it would use military operations to free hostages just as it did two days ago. And Hamas, in turn, said it welcomed elements of the resolution, but did not endorse the plan as a whole. Hamas emphasizes its readiness to cooperate with the mediators to engage in indirect negotiations, it said in a statement. But the shift in Israeli politics over the weekend could complicate all of it. Israel's position, of course, in the ceasefire, Secretary of State met with the Israeli prime minister, whose emergency wartime government was jolted over the withdrawal of centrist National Unity Party and its leader, Benny Gantz, from Mr. Netanyahu's wartime government. You may have heard about that. So it's really unclear what this means and where we will go moving forward. But the proposal approved on Monday by the Security Council was based on a three-phase plan laid out by President Biden in May. This seems like it's developing hour to hour, much less day to day. All right, let me move on to, I think, a good news story. According to the FBI's latest data, there has been a historic drop in crime. I mean, you're not going to hear that from a lot of news outlets, obviously, that live to scare you and get ratings. And even with the drop in crime, there are still horrific things happening all the time that get reported. So it doesn't seem like that. But apparently, violent crime has dropped 15%. And the first three months of 2024 saw a continued drop in levels of violent crime and murder across the country. Trend that the Attorney General, Merrick Garland, is calling historic reported incidents of violent crime dropped 15% between January and March of this year compared to the same period last year according to the FBI's uniform crime reporting data murders dropped more than 26% in the same time period according to that data so I think that's good news I wanted to mention that and you hear all the terrible things that are happening in the world but of course, always want to remind you, those are the aberrations, the exceptions, the outside the norm. That's why they get reported. You don't hear a man made it home safely to his family and kissed his wife and kids and went to bed because that is the norm. Good things happen. Love happens infinitely more than the horrible things. And that's why they get reported and we respond to them. But statistics matter. Trends matter. And they should help hopefully inform and educate you about what risks you're going to take or not take in terms of going here or going there and worrying about crime, letting your kids go places. It really does become ridiculous the way it can control your mind. So let that data help you feel a little bit better. Let's go to uh, Russia, where the president, Vladimir Putin of Russia, I don't know why I needed to tell you that because I already said who I was talking about. Apparently he said on Friday that even the combined arsenals of Europe and the United States would be no match for Russia's in a nuclear confrontation. But he also said, I hope this never, ever happens. The reason that Moscow's supremacy in the Ukraine war has made that grim scenario very unlikely. Okay, well, that's good. It's good to hear. Thanks, Vlad. So it's great to hear from you. 
Uh, here is two other pieces, I think, of good news. Fingers crossed on this one. Moderna, the pharmaceutical company, said Monday that its combination vaccine to protect against COVID and influenza generated a stronger immune response in adults aged 50 and over when compared to separate shots against the viruses in a late stage trial. So I want to learn more about that. I'm supposed to be talking to Peter Hotez sometime soon. I'll ask him about that and so much more. But the other story I want to mention is that the FDA, they have advisors who have endorsed a new Alzheimer's drug. A committee of independent advisors to the Food and Drug Administration voted unanimously yesterday that the benefits of the newest experimental drug for Alzheimer's disease far outweigh the risks. How about that? And I don't know how closely you're paying attention to the Hunter Biden case, but the Case has gone to the jury. Prosecutors wrapped up closing arguments, and we'll see what's going to happen in the next couple of days. During an hour-long closing argument, the lead prosecutor connected dozens of evidentiary dots as he sought to show that President Biden's deeply troubled son willfully falsified the gun form, claiming to be drug-free at a time when he was addicted to crack cocaine. So I'm sure we'll know more in the next couple of days, and the president has vowed not to pardon his son. But, well, we'll see what happens. And Apple announced yesterday, Apple Computers, that it would be entering the AI fray. I've got a news report for you coming up on that. But after lagging behind its rivals in the artificial intelligence race for the last two years, Apple announced yesterday that its smartphones would soon feature several tools powered by generative AI. More on that coming up. Yesterday, the disgraced former president made history, becoming the first former American president to check in with a probation officer, which is a crazy and hilarious and dangerous thing to say, I guess. Also, Cornell West's presidential campaign, struggling in practically every way, but apparently as a group of operatives with Republican ties that are working on trying to get the far-left candidate onto the ballot in North Carolina, which is expected to be one of the South's most competitive states in the fall, so that would suck. And in Georgia, the second congressional district, Republican candidate Chuck Hand walked out of a televised debate over the weekend ahead of next week's primary runoff. And I've got audio for you on that. That's pretty interesting. Coming up. And then what else can I tell you? Some parts of South Florida are expected to get up to a foot or more of rain this week. The West is going to continue to bake. That's supposed to come across the country, apparently. And finally, a good news story. A dog named Blue ran four miles with glass in his snout to get help after his owner crashed his truck into a ravine. Man was traveling with his four dogs when he failed to negotiate a curve, crashed over an embankment. This took place in Pine Valley in uh, San Diego, Southern California. So uh, one of his dogs ran to their camp and alerted the, the family members, which is just crazy. And his, his relatives set out, search for him, located him, and his other three, three dogs all found alive. How about that for a good news story? All right, those are your headlines. They take a lot longer to put together. Really, I contribute all day to my list than it seems when I produce it here. So I hope you appreciate it. And uh, if you don't, let me know. Tell me how to make it better. Tell me what's annoying. Tell me what you like. Tell me what you don't. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com, patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. You can always pay more if you really appreciate that news segment, which I put a lot into. That's just the headlines. Now let's get to the sound bites. Here's the Subish News correspondent talking about the announcement of Apple AI. China is joining forces with chat GPT. They're calling it Apple intelligence. And Nora, this is supposed to be AI that knows what you want. ...from Apple involving artificial intelligence. CBS's Carter Evans has more on the big reveal. The tech giant is joining forces with chat GPT. They're calling it Apple Intelligence. And Nora, this is supposed to be AI that knows what you want even before you do. Siri's about to get very personal. This is AI for the rest of us. Apple Intelligence will gather personal data from your devices to automatically perform tasks like determining if you could still make it to your child's recital when a meeting's rescheduled. The company claims it's completely secure because much of the processing will be done on the device. Complex AI computing will go to secure servers. Siri will find and understand things it never could before without compromising your privacy. Well, there you go. Apple AI coming to your phone, and there's nothing you or I can do about it. How do you feel about that one? All right, this is a weird one, this story, and I got the audio to match it. 
And I mentioned uh, in the news headlines, the Georgia congressional candidate Chuck Hand walked out of his district's Republican primary debate Sunday after delivering a speech against his opponent, A. Wayne Johnson. He was asked by the moderator whether he would support a controversial bill to cut food aid for low-income Americans. And Chuck Hand, who's convicted of a misdemeanor for taking part in the January 6th insurrection, that's right, he was an insurrection, broke off into an unrelated speech attacking his opponent. Here it is. Um, Congress is currently working on a new farm bill, which will have a big impact on the second district. What are your thoughts on the current House Republican plan? And specifically, would you support the controversial proposal to cut uh, food aid for low-income Americans? I'm Chuck Hand, lifelong resident of the second district. I've worked side by side with the people of the second district, solving problems since 2018. I've only seen this man next to me come around when it's election time, wanting to run for office. I've been wearing tires slam out in southwest Georgia, meeting with voters and building relationships in our communities for years now. I'm not interested in debating the issues of the second district with a man who doesn't even reside in it, especially one who orchestrates attacks on my wife. I'm more concerned about beating Sanford Bishop, representing you and passing the America First agenda and putting Donald Trump back in the White House. This race is very simple. It's either 8th District money or 2nd District heart. The choice is yours. It's the dollar versus the change. Now, this is where I get back in my truck and head back to southwest Georgia because I got two two races to win. Thank you very much. Doug Reardon, uh, you're not staying, sir? (laughs) Are you leaving? (laughs) Okay. All right, that's yeah. Well, I guess I? we will continue, and we have I'll questions. ask. All right, see you later, man. Okay, he's going to leave then. That'll be that'll be real interesting. All right, now for a much more important story. You probably heard about this uh, audio that was surreptitiously recorded by this liberal activist, and it was of Supreme Court. Justice uh, Samuel Alito, it was at this kind of Catholic, some kind of Supreme Court gala. I'm sorry. It was a Supreme Court gala of some sort. You had to pay like 500 bucks to be there. And this reporter, Lauren Windsor, I guess she's a reporter. I guess she refers to herself as a reporter. She asked him all these questions surreptitiously. And Justice Alito told this woman who was posing as a Catholic conservative that compromise in America between the left and the right might be impossible. And then agreed with the view that the nation should return to a place of godliness. You probably heard the audio. I actually don't have that, but I do have Dahlia Lithwick's reaction to it on MSNBC yesterday, and I wanted to play that for you. What an extraordinary new piece of information and revealing comments in his own words on tape from Samuel Alito. I think it's it's fair to say, and I, I I know you didn't mean it this way, but I will accept the criticism that, you know, the Supreme Court dedicated press corps has a little bit been on screen save on this story for a very long time. We've known a lot, a lot, a lot of things were a little hinky. And I think most of us just felt like it was our job to report the cases and not the conduct. So, you know, thankfully, what surged into the void uh, was, as you said, you know, Politico and ProPublica and The New York Times and now Lauren Windsor, who are saying, you know, the conduct is not just shocking and unconscionable and should be covered. But and this is important. I think it's what uh, Senator Whitehouse was was getting at uh, in the promo. It's intrinsically connected to the cases that we cover. It is intrinsically connected to the doctrine that they produce, because these are justices who, who in their private lives day after day, show that they're in the tank for one side. All right, we love Dahlia Lithwick. I got to get her back on this show, but listen to her show. It's very, very good over at Slate. And here is Jake Tapper on the disgraced former president's virtual meeting with his New York probation officer. Also in our Law and Justice League today, Donald Trump attended his pre-sentencing interview virtually today with a probation officer after that Manhattan jury found him guilty of 36, 34 felony charges last month related to that cover-up of a hush money payment to adult film actress and director Stormy Daniels. CNN's John Miller joins us now. John, what's the, what's the purpose of today's interview? What did the probation officer likely ask the 45th president? So the purpose of today's interview is for them to prepare a PSR or a pre-sentence report for the judge. 
This is basically where the probation department, which could, in today's meeting, have included the commissioner, um, a couple of senior members, maybe a social worker, but it's where the probation department meets with uh, someone who is going to come for sentencing, and they ask questions about family background, financial status, living situation, um, a lot of basic questions, which coming from Donald Trump would have not the usual answers right. they I've get heard from enough, the common defendant. And I want to move on. But, so how about it? It's just worth mentioning. Now, here is the former Speaker of the House, Speaker Emeritus Nancy Pelosi on MSNBC also yesterday, responding to some of the crazy things the disgraced former president said in his weird Las Vegas rally over the weekend. See, Madam Speaker, nice to see you. Thank you for being here. My pleasure to be here. Thank you, Nicole. Why do you think this is stirred up and a brouhaha on the on the right and in some corners of the media today? Well, because of the... Uh, the fact is that the president of the United States, the former president, and his toadies do not want to face the facts. They're trying to do revisionist history on January 6th. But we cannot let us be uh, dragged into their, again, uh, false impression of what happened that day. They know what happened that day. They know how serious it is and was and continues to have an impact on our country. And yet they want to call the, the people who were in there um, hostages. Last night I received the Lincoln Award. I was so proud of receiving that. And I said in my remarks, Lincoln built the dome on the Capitol. He insisted that it be built during the Civil War so that it could um, uh, show the resilience of America. And to see these people coming through the Capitol with their foul deeds and foul actions, waving Confederate flags and Nazi flags under Lincoln's dome was so shameful. And yet this president who incited, this former president who incited this insurrection would not send the National Guard for hours. People were harmed. People were killed, but died one way or another. And what did he do but try to deny that any of it happened? This is a terrible thing. But let us not take away the attention of what we need to do to go forward. We have to unify our country. We have to bring people together in a way, in a way that honors the vision of our founders, the sacrifice of our men and women in uniform. All right. Well, I, you know, okay. That'd be great. Let's do it. Let's bring everybody together. Thank you. That's the former speaker, Nancy Pelosi. And now what else do I have for you? Oh, here is an insurrectionist. This is Carrie Lake. She's running for U.S. Senate in Arizona. Here she is on one of those right-wing news networks, still claiming that she's the actual rightful governor of Arizona. And in Arizona, our illegitimate, you know, terrible governor is doing nothing about it, forcing the Border Patrol to continue to process people. All right. Well, there's that. Now let's go over to CNN where Aaron Burnett last night, she was talking to former Oath Keeper. He is a uh, he's converted. He's no longer Oath Keeper, but he's the former Oath Keeper spokesman. And he was reacting to the far right election wins in Europe. And I wanted to hear from this guy's name is Jason Van Tatenhove. Maybe I should have him on. You know, the far right movement in the United States so well. How emboldened are they by what we are now seeing happen tonight across Europe? Well, I, I think it does play a part. I think, um, you know, what happens here ripples across the world and that happens back and forth. You know, those victories are going to be seen as a victory here, too, that there's momentum growing. And um, I, I think we need to take it as kind of a dire warning as to where we really are right now, even with a, a front runner that that is has just been found guilty of so many charges it, it it just doesn't seem to matter there's um there's certainly momentum growing all right that guy seems pretty interesting actually i'm gonna i'll reach out to him and now here is jb pritzker he is the governor of illinois and uh, i thought this was a pretty good tear against donald trump that i saw on twitter and so i don't know where he was speaking but listen to this donald trump is a convicted felon, an adjudicated rapist, and a congenital liar. He's a racist, sexist, misogynistic narcissist who wants to use the levers of power to enrich himself and punish anyone who dares speak a word against him. He has stolen state 
secrets, compromised our national security, betrayed our constitution, and sacrificed the truth to further his own naked ambition. When Trump comes to Milwaukee for the Republican convention, he'll cast blame on others for his own misdeeds. He'll claim credit for things that he never touched. He'll lie and he'll ramble. Yeah, J.B. Pritzker, I like that one a lot. Well done, sir. All right, well, I wanted to play this for you. I thought that was important to remember and learn a little bit about Reverend James Lawson, who is a civil rights icon, South Los Angeles pastor. He died at the age of 95 yesterday, and CBS Los Angeles' Pat Harvey interviewed him several times, took a look at his life, and I wanted to include her two-minute report. And, of course, uh, Reverend Lawson worked closely with Martin Luther King Jr., and, well, you'll learn a lot more about him as I did. I thought this was important, and I wanted to include it in today's news. News clips. Southern California and the world has lost a civil rights icon. The Reverend James Lawson Jr., who stood side by side with Martin Luther King Jr. in the fight for equal rights, has died. Mr. Lawson was a loyal advocate for nonviolent resistance to racism, even in the face of brutality. And tonight we are taking a look back at his life and the incredible legacy he leaves behind. He was often called the mind of the movement. Reverend James Lawson dedicated his life to the fight for freedom and equality. Lawson grew up in Massillon, Ohio. His biggest influence, his father, a pastor. I grew up in an atmosphere of love and compassion in the black church, in my family. From the age of four, knew that I was going to be fighting racism. Prejudice. By junior high, Lawson knew he too would be a pastor. So when he was called into the draft, he resisted, serving 13 months in prison during the Korean War. Once parole, Lawson studied in India, where he learned Mahatma Gandhi's principles of nonviolence. Shortly after, he met Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. after a speech at Oberlin College. This past August, during our last conversation with the civil rights icon, he shared that there was an immediate bond between the two. We were spiritual brothers in every way that that's possible. It was then that Dr. King urged Lawson to join the civil rights movement in the South. Without hesitation, the lifelong activist began hosting workshops and trained many future leaders, including John Lewis, James Bevel, and Diane Nash, just to name a few. Reverend Lawson and his students' nonviolent resistance led to the desegregation of Nashville's lunch counters, a first for the U.S. Lawson and his students were behind every major milestone of the civil rights movement, including the momentous march on Washington 60 years ago. And while the March on Washington was a momentous event, Reverend Lawson continued his work in the 1960s and early 1970s, speaking against the Vietnam War. In 1974, he became senior pastor of Holman United Methodist Church in South L.A. and trained local labor leaders and activists, later teaching classes at UCLA and Cal State Northridge. When we asked Lawson about not slowing down at the age of 95, he was clear that there was still work to be done. Of course, all over the world, all over the country. All right, I thought that was real great and important, and so I'm glad I included it. And finally, here's Jimmy Kimmel with some laughs from ABC. Jimmy Kimmel live when he took a look at the uh, contenders for VP. Disgraced former presidents put out a short list of contenders, and here's what Kimmel did with it. Sports are saying that Trump has whittled his list of potential running mates down to four contenders. They are all men. The rumored final four said to be in contention are Florida Senator Marco Rubio. We have a con artist as the front runner in the Republican Party. I mean, this guy bankrupted a casino. How do you bankrupt a casino? Ohio Senator J.D. Vance. I'm a never Trump guy. I never liked him. I can't stomach Trump. I think that he's Noxious. On Twitter, Vance called Trump, quote, reprehensible, an idiot. North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum. Would you ever do business with Donald Trump? Uh, I don't think so. Why? I would, I just think that it's important that you're uh, judged by the company you keep. And South Carolina Senator Tim Scott. <laughs> I just love you. No, that's good. <laughs> I think we have a winner. I mean, isn't that great? That's 
How are these guys... How are they not ashamed of themselves? We have this on video. At least Tim Scott has been slurping Trump's ass since the first day. <laughs> the rest of them are such spineless, impotent, boot-licking slugs. The only thing that surprised me is Ted Cruz isn't on the list, really. <laughs> you know, there are 37 countries that Donald Trump, as a convicted felon, is not allowed to visit. And another impact of these many felony convictions is he loses his license to carry a concealed weapon, which, um, if you think about it, it's pretty crazy a guy who's not allowed to carry a concealed weapon would be allowed to carry a nuclear weapon. (laughs) This is like your parents saying, you know what, you can't have a puppy, but if you get good grades, we'll buy you a werewolf. (laughs) I love that. All right, well, there you go. That is your news update. That is your opening headlines and sound bites. I try to get it done Monday through Friday, usually definitely Monday through Thursday. Host the Hangout on Thursday. Hope to see you there this week at 8 p.m. East. Always a great time to get renewed, replenished, laugh, cry, talk, connect. I hope to see you there. And uh, who is often there is today's guest, Will Judy. Will is a physician. He's a primary care physician now, works in urgent care in Texas, where he lives with his family. Will found this podcast by listening to the Unreasonable podcast, and I'm really excited to have him on as a guest here on the show for the first time. I told you a whole bunch about him at the top, but... I hope you'll click on all the links to him and his work, especially secularhouston.org, which he mentions a couple times in our conversation, is his real baby. But he talks a lot about his activism, his life, and why it all matters to him. He's a real cool guy, and I've loved getting to know him. I'm really happy to showcase him and his activism and his personality, just his character here on the show. Just a a great member of our community. I love to feature members here on the show. So without further ado, go follow him on social media, support his work. Dr. Will Judy, welcome to Stand Up. Yeah, there he is. Will, officially a guest on Stand Up. Really excited to talk to you, to familiarize you with everybody listening. And thank you, man. It's been great to have you as part of our community at our Hangouts, and especially this last week. Good to be here, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, there's a a lot to talk about with your activism, your organizing, your politics, and obviously your life. But you are a physician. You are you work in urgent care in Texas, where you also grew up. Uh, all true. All true. Yep. Why did you become a physician? Why did you want to do that? I was always good in science and math. I was a pretty smart kid. And a uh, one day I was in the playground and I broke my collarbone. I just I was jumping through swings, doing what kid what boys do. Landed on the ground real hard on my shoulder. My mom took me to the doctor, took, they, he took x-rays and he showed me the x-rays and I was blown away. Yeah, my shoulder hurt, but you could see all over my ribs, my little broken clavicle. And since then I was like, man, I want to be a doctor. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. And to this day, when in the urgent care, when kids come through and they have uh, any x-rays, whether they're broken or not, broken bones or not, I'll take them in the back and I'll show them the x-rays just because of that. And I, I just I get chills. I, I love doing that. And they think it's so cool. I'll have the mom or dad bring in the cell phones. They can take the uh, screenshots because sometimes the kids are just like, oh, no big deal. But then they get home and they're like, oh, no, da, 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 da. So, uh, that's smart. Yeah. yeah, you're using new media, the internet technology these kids all have to make it a little less painless, a little more fun to break a bone. And then they get to have that right. for future needs of resilience. What do you say to like someone says I could never be a physician simply because on day one, I didn't even like dissecting a frog. I didn't like the the worm, the smell of it and so on. Don't you have to overcome the sight of uh, shit and blood somehow to be able to, like that, you have to be that kind of person first, right? Or no? Not first, but you have to tolerate it. If you have a total aversion to, to the gross stuff, you can't, there are specialties that you have no, contact with people or grow stuff but you have to go through training and you're going to see a bunch of grow stuff in training so you got to get through that how hard was it all how hard was it for you to become a, a physician and when you did how did you any regrets any is it just all triumph is it all pride <laughs> no no regrets it's what i wanted to do since that when i was 10 when i broke my bone and i was lucky i just my the path was fairly easy and not easy but i the path i wanted it, it happened and it was a lot of hard work, sure. And medical school was pretty tough and, and residency. 
it's now you don't have to be especially smart they just have to deal with a lot of shit and and it's a marathon uh, it's just more long term how did you do you mind if i ask how you afforded all of that because i always hear from doctors they're like it seems like they're paying back their medical school is very expensive and there's different ways but it is yeah i went to medical school a while ago i'm your age so it's i went to medical school in the early 90s and yeah it a balloon exploded back uh since then oh really yeah i'm still paying off uh i got i just went i had loans all through medical school and some of college and my parents helped some i had some loans i i could work in college and i did a work study but can't do that in medical school it's 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 all everything you have goes into the studies right um, yeah i'm still paying off medical school loans i i became a primary care doctor so it's not it's as far as pay scales go doctor wise it's on the lower end so two girls very young early families again no regrets uh so how old are your daughters 25 and 22 Wow. Oh, yeah. you, you said you had them when you were very young. That's right. Back in residency. So I just said a little explaining why I still have some medical school debt. Oh yeah. Fair enough. Wow. How, how are your daughters? Are you close with them? Oh yeah. Yeah. They're, 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 they're wonderful. I'm so proud of them. They live here in Houston. They actually live together. And so things are really good right now. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. That's very cool. That's like a little fairy tale. Yeah. So you grew up and stayed in Texas this your, most of your life? Yep. Yep. I grew up in South Texas by Mexico all the way down South. And so it's officially Texas, but it's really Tex-Mex. And I had a, yeah. And then went up to college in Waco, then landed in Houston for medical school. I've been here ever since, since 93. So yeah, Texas, my whole life, but different flavors of Texas. Yeah. There are many. There are. Yep. Yep. Huge state. Your background, your dad, you're telling us is from Haiti. Yep. Yeah. My dad's Haiti from Haiti. My mom's uh, Mexican American. So Afro Latino, you identify as Afro Latino. What does yeah. that come with? Spider Man, the 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 cartoon Spider Man, the anime. Oh, that's funny. That's the first. I, that's like probably one of the first prominent Afro Latinos, and he was animated. I'm sure I'm missing some other ones because I'm a white. When you <laughs> grown up in Texas, though, with that background, like your mom's Mexican, your dad's Haitian. There, was there Creole, French, Spanish, English? Is there a lot of different cultural things happening? Did you, did you feel like you probably were exposed to a lot living there and growing up with those parents? What was it like? It, it was, I, I loved it. It's all I know and all I knew, but I love it, especially growing up in it and looking back, it was great. I grew up, where I grew up, it was all Tex-Mex. Uh, that was a stew I, I was raised in. So pretty much a vato. I had the accent and everything. The cult, that was my culture that I, I grew up in. So I learned Spanish and English uh, at the same time. And yeah, my dad didn't teach my sister and I French Creole just because he thought yeah, we'd, we'd never use it, concentrate on Spanish. And he was absolutely right. I, if we, I, we learned Creole. I would never have used it. Huh. I only have no idea what Tex-Mex in the, what, 80s and 90s, what that even means. But it sounds pretty interesting. Sounds a lot more interesting than what I grew up with, but I'm think I'm just thinking about food. Yeah, food was terrific. It has a blend of uh, Mexican dishes, Tex-Mex, and just the regular American stuff. So it was, it was great. So as I shift to talking about your work and your activism to some extent, what about religion? What was there anything other than Christianity, and what did you learn, and how are you brought up? In the household, it wasn't very religious. We didn't go to church as a family. It was just, we just weren't, it wasn't a religious environment in the house. But my dad put my sister and I in a private school so we can go at our own pace back way back then. The only option was that it's non-denominational Christian school, like a schoolhouse, all the grades are mixed. And But every day, every school day, we got an hour of Bible study. So that's where I became indoctrinated. I was born again, good Christian kid from age maybe eight or so until really my early 40s. Yeah, I just... I believe for many years, but when I got out of that school, went to a regular high school, college, medical school, just started learning about the bigger world, meeting other people, it just made less and less sense as I slowly flittered away from religion. Uh, there was no trauma. There was no one event. It just flittered away. Oh, that's really interesting. Often there is a book, a documentary, a, for me, George Carlin's albums really it was the first time I ever heard anybody criticize harshly religion, I think, in that way. And it was hilarious. So it really appealed to me. I was a young man, teenager. But so up until your 40s, you were what? How do you describe your <clears throat> relationship to your religion, your spirituality, your practice, your beliefs? I was Christian. Um, I, it wasn't a big deal in my life. If someone 
took the Lord's name in vain or criticized the Holy Spirit, I wouldn't get up. I wouldn't get, I wouldn't clutch my pearls. It was just, it just didn't mean all that much to me, but I still believe again, it was just slow flittering away. Um, Weird that you're wearing pearls right now. I will say that. (laughs) Didn't clutch them though. He didn't, I didn't even want to say anything in the elephant in the room, but so were you a, did you have beliefs, the criticism now of the Christian nationalists and often the Christian right is you say that you're Christian, but you don't act like a good person in any way. And we'll get to why you don't need to be religious, obviously, to be a good person. But usually think when someone's overt about their, in this case, Christianity or any other religion, but talking about America generally, that you're shocked maybe when you find out that they're a cruel person. They're mean. They do all kinds of terrible things and think and say terrible things. What was... Did your Christianity inform your character? Were you consistent in some ways in terms of what you believed and how you lived your life? Great question, man. You're good at this. And conversely, if you beat an atheist, you're surprised if they're a good person. Same. Uh, yeah. 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 And that was me. So growing up, I, yes, I was a good kid. I cared about other people. I was empathetic. I wanted to help the poor. Uh, did Christianity put, put that in me or is that just, that's just the way I was? I don't know, but I did grow up a Christian. I did. I, that was my personality when, and that continued through my adulthood. And when I did finally leave Christianity, became an atheist, that empathy, the compassion increased. Would it have increased if I was still a Christian? I don't know. Maybe I'll concede that, but I know it didn't go away. It increased. And for the, to the other point, yeah, when I was a believer, if I met you and shook your hand and you say, Hey, I'm a P Dominic, I'm an atheist. I would recoil instantly oh bad evil so i i get it i i get how believers out there think because i was one of them for a while was there a point will where you said out loud or officially in a journal or your family i am no longer christian i don't identify as that and i don't know maybe i i don't know what i am but i'm not that was there a moment for you where you said that to yourself or, or anyone else I go through the phases. So all paths lead to the, to heaven, multiple, all religions lead to the same place if you're a good person. And then like pantheism, spirituality, everything's God, like the force and Star Wars. And then I ultimately landed in a secular group in Houston, the Houston Oasis, kind of met other non-believers other, and atheists. I really hadn't hung out with a, a group of them before. And that's where I decided, yeah, I'm just going to, in my head, it was a mental exercise. Jesus was a balloon and I'm going to just cut the cord and let Jesus float away. I thank you. I don't need you anymore. It took a month for me to cut that balloon in my head. Like I, and it was really pissing me off. Like, why is this so hard, man? This I didn't believe this shit for, for a while now, but it was just this core belief. And this was like ultimately the act of letting Jesus go. After about a month, I just finally did it. Snip and he went away and it's been terrific ever since. You can always go back. I could. Yep. Yep. It's always there. I'm, I, well, I'm in the book of life. It's, it'll be an easy uh, return. What does that mean? When you're born again, your name is in the book of life and apparently you're there for forever. Hmm. I don't know. Take it for what it is. I should just have somebody hire somebody to get me in there just for <laughs> up my bases. Like Gmail back in the day. It's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting the way you describe letting Jesus go. And I'm sure that some people hear that and probably cringe because they're still, they have a close relationship with Jesus if they're strong believers and so on. Do you ever have tough conversations with people when they find out that you went through this transformation or how do you handle it if it comes up? I tend to hang out with similar people in a bubble. And I've, tried, I've started to get out of that more, which has been, I think, healthy. But yeah, I, the conversations I have with believers are so tough. They don't recoil from me. They know me as a good person. And if they are curious, I'm, I'm gentle. I, I get it. Uh, I don't know where this, the questions come from. Are they questioning themselves? Are they trying to find a weak spot? Are they trying to say, aha, blah, blah, blah. Right. I don't know, but I'm fine, whatever. I haven't had really difficult or really aggressive conversations with believers. They've all been great. When you evolved to where you're at now, and I'm sure you're continuing like we all are, hopefully, when did you start seeking out a community? Because I don't think that's normal. I think it's great. And you seem like the kind of guy who is extroverted and confident enough to to do that kind of a thing. You're obviously a physician, though 
my best friend, one of my best friends, a physician, he's one of the most introverted people I know. But at what point did you be like, I want to actually go out and meet like-minded people in the secular atheist community? Because it's a huge community and you've, you're part of it there in Houston, but there's different communities all over the world of similar uh, believers. At what point did you like put, take the steps to go find other people and how, and what's it like? Yeah, I'm actually more of an introvert than an extrovert. Wow, huh. I fake it. Yeah, it's I'm old, so I've figured it, it it has use. And yeah, I wasn't looking for a community. I was just living my life. And I was actually wooing a, a woman. And she's the one that introduced me to Houston Oasis. She said, hey, look at this. Because we had talked about religion and our flitter, floating away from faith. And she said, hey, check out this Houston Oasis. It's here in town. You want to go? And so I was like, yeah. Sure. And I looked it up and it was great. That had core beliefs and this group, the community, it, volunteer events. It, it looked terrific. So yeah, I started going and it didn't work out with us, but, but I kept, I, I stayed and I, this, that was my introduction into a secular community. We hear this so much. Oh, I had thought I was the only one or, oh, I never thought there were communities out there for people like me. So I'm out there as much as I can to, and including the show, to let people know that there are communities and I want to be a resource. That's why I'm here. I want to be, I want this to be practical. And if anyone has any questions about any secular groups, non-belief groups, uh, atheist groups, whatever, in, in where you are, I can help facilitate that. And if anybody wants to talk to Will, all of his contact information is in the show notes, but is there a website that you want to plug specifically? I think I have something here, but. My baby, secularhouston.com, which we'll get into later. Yeah. Uh, American Atheist is a great is a great resource to find a, a community ne- uh, near you. And I mean, I'm actually a state director for American Atheist for, for Texas. So I want to talk about all the work that you're doing with those organizations. But like when you say when you first joined this secular Houston or started going to what are you doing? What is everybody you hang out? Do you, because the thing about church is you get together every Sunday and that's a great thing. Community is a great thing. Stand-up right. community, which you're a member of, is magical for so many of us for so many different reasons. It's a virtual community mostly, but it's still – it's an amazing thing. But you, I think, are both involved virtually and in real life, and what do you do? You mentioned volunteer events and, and or something like that, but is there a regular thing? Because I was looking at the calendar. It seems like you guys have a lot of actual things going on. We do, and you're absolutely right that humans need community. I think humanity is boiled down to its essence, I think, is being nurturing to other humans. And community is a way to do that. And yeah, what we do, it's Houston. There's different groups do different things. Houston Oasis, which is where I got my start. And I'm still on the board of Houston Oasis. And there's multiple chapters around the nation, but it's structured kind of churchy. So there's live music. We try to support live music. There's a talk, usually based in science. It could be arts, a lot of things, but there's secular lectures, basically. Um, Coffee breaks and just it's community. And then we offer other events throughout the week. So bar nights. I have a blues night that I I host once a month and volunteer events. So these are ways that you can meet up on other days of the week, other parts of Houston, because Houston's huge. But yeah, I figure, and it's true that why should churches have a monopoly on this this regimen, the live music and uh, talk and, and coffee break and being there for each other. It is churchy, but why sh- why do they get to have a monopoly on that? They shouldn't, and, and, and religion shouldn't. Whether you do ultimate Frisbee or you get together for your gardening club or your dogs at the dog park or your running group, it's so vital and important to be part of a community, whether it be small or, or big. And I just love this idea, though, about getting together around these beliefs that you have. You are, I can tell, such a good guy. Obviously, you're a physician, so you you treat people for a living. It feels like that's the best spokesman for a non-believer because, like you said earlier, people think that there's something wrong with you or that you're a bad person or that you don't have morals and values. When people have said that to me from time to time when I tell them I'm not religious – where's your moral compass? I'm like, I don't know, the UN Human Rights, the, the, the right. hu- hu- Human Rights Charter, Civil Rights. Oh, it's, it doesn't have to come from God or religion. It can easily come from any other kind of philosophy. What do you 
what drives you to be a, a good person if you're not afraid of burning an eternal hellfire or living with your dead family in heaven? Yeah, I, it's scary to let those go because there's so much comfort in being able to spend eternity with your loved ones. But that was part of the flitter, flittering away. It just didn't make sense. And it just made sense that we have this life and we do the best that we can with it. And that's it. And I actually feel a ton of comfort from that. It makes this struggle, it makes this life way more enjoyable. But yeah, so I'm an atheist. So I, I, that's what I don't believe in. But what, what I do believe in is secular humanism. So where do the morals come from? I believe they just come, they're innate to who we are as humans. And we humans do better if we nurture other humans, community that comes from within, that comes from all our evolution of 100, 500,000 years, that, that's why we have succeeded so much, so well up to now. That's all I can say, yeah. I, I usually use that as two sides of the same coin, atheism and secular humanism. Does it come up in your role of, as a physician ever with patients, with coworkers even, religion, what you believe? I'm sure you deal with people who are very sick or in, in, in real dangerous situations. Never has. It was very seldom has. It, it, they don't. My work is really cool. They, it's a compartmentalized work in my activism and my and work. My work is totally great with that. I've only had a couple of patients that like we had a really good interaction and they were both old ladies and they were like, you're so sweet. Uh, are you a Christian? And I just cringe. Uh, <laughs> at this point, I was not a Christian, but I just I, I just made some quick calculations in my head. And I was just I just said something. Not, I would say, I would say, yes. I'd be like, yeah, go ahead. I said Whatever. something like that. Yeah. Sweet old lady. If if she's in that situation, I think I'd be fine with it. Like, I don't need to, I don't need to stand on principle in every single situation in my life. I used to be more like that, I think. But then I realized it often can create divisiveness or just, and for nothing, you're not changing anything in, in that case. So it's, I like to say stand up sometimes, most of the time. So when it comes to what drives your beliefs, you're talking about these lectures at, at your gatherings and so on. I'm obsessed with, and I almost want to be calling myself a Buddhist at this point. I read Buddhism every day and I read a, like, a lot of Stoicism now, but I guess both those, I feel like come under philosophy. And now there's all these new age entrepreneurs trying to hijack it all and rewrite it. And that's fine. I'm fine with it. But like, the ancient philosophies, like people figured this stuff out. Humans figured out a lot like 2,000 years ago and how to deal with daily struggle, anxiety, depression, all of it. I practice that stuff. I read it every day. Do you think about those types of philosophies? Does any of that interest you, Will? Not so much. I'll listen to it, but I I live my life the way I do. I just, I keep it so busy that I don't really – get into the meaning of what I'm doing so much. I just, it's more of the present. Like I'm doing it. I have to do this. I have to prepare to do this. So yeah, I don't get in much into the philosophy. That, but that, see, that, that confounds me that someone like you isn't. And I get a little narrow-minded about how is everybody not reading the same stuff I'm reading? And I think part of it is why I'm doing it. And I think it's to deal with stress and anxiety and frustration, depression, failure, setbacks, whatever. I really got into it when I lost my corporate gig a lot more. I've always been into it. Mm -hmm. But what about you? You're, a, you're my age. It sounds like on paper, it looks like your life is awesome. But do you not, if you're dealing with struggles, whether they be daily or not, ang worry, concern, stress, anxiety, what is your, what do you do? I will, yeah, actually, there's one philosophical thing I did pick up. That, yeah, my, my life is great. I, I find it very fulfilling. I'm busy. I'm tired a lot. I've worn thin a little bit, but it's all very fulfilling. But my, my friend, Dr. Anthony Penn, I've heard a bunch of his talks, and he always ends with this. He's big into philosophy. He, he loves Camus. And in my day job, I have to be outcomes oriented. So the outcomes have to be great all the time uh, in my doctor job. But in being a progressive activist in Texas, I can't, you can't do that. Otherwise you burn out. You get so dis disenfranchised. You get so uh, dis um, disappointed. And so I'll switch my mindset to more of, I find joy in the struggle. 
and the people I meet, being in the trenches with, with people, fighting elbow to elbow with uh, interfaith people, with other atheists, doing uh, just being there with them. I find joy in that struggle. Dr. Penn mentions Camus, he says, uh, the story of Sisyphus. Imagine Sisyphus happy. Imagine ro him rolling that rock up the mountain and that brings him happiness. And that's it. I, I find joy in the struggle. Oh, that's really, <laughs> it's really helpful. Chill, oh, chill, right. man. <laughs> Anthony Penn. Oh, that's interesting. And what I heard you say is being a progressive activist in Texas, you mm -hmm. lose a lot. Yeah. And so when you lose, and, and it's very hard to lose when you've invested a lot of time and energy in any kind of campaign or candidate or, or initiative. And when you lose, a lot of people just wash out. I can't take that again. It's such right. a kind of rejection and failure. It's just we lost the, the school board fight. And it just, it was, it's been so hard. Right. And, but what you're saying, what I'm hearing you say is being a progressive in Texas, you lose a lot, but you find purpose in the work, in the struggle. And you get a lot out of meeting people along the way. That's, is that what you're saying? Is that, that's what I'm hearing. That's absolutely right. And yeah, it's, it's, it, you have, it's weird. You have to shift your mind. It's, it's hard to do that. It, a lot of people can't do that. It took me a while, but uh, once you do that, it's, you can, you can go further. And the way I also see it in my head is that, Hey, I'm part of this effort to push back on the bullshit that we're seeing in, in Texas. If we weren't here to push back on it, maybe this bullshit would have gone way further than it has. So if enough, at the end of my activism, whenever I do give it up far from now, if nothing has changed, I'm, I still consider that a victory because maybe it could have been a lot worse. It's such a great point that people never make and people never think about. I often hear those criticisms. I remember Paul Ryan used to always criticize safety net policies and anything that is government to help poor people, of course. And it would, there's talking points like the war on poverty is a failure and, and all of that. And, and it's, it's always, if we didn't have the policies that we did have, people would be so much worse off. If we didn't have Medicare, old folks would be so much worse off, social security and so on. And that's what you're saying. You make things, uh, if you made things a little better by just being in the fight for as long as you were, that is something that is purposeful and satisfying. Absolutely. So talk to me about the actual work that you're doing because it's been effective. As you see the numbers in America of people leaving religion, becoming less religious, turning away from religion in many ways, but obviously the very religious people often are the loudest and they're winning a lot of fights even though they're a minority on in the courts Rather, they're in the Supreme Court, I guess, is why they're winning a lot. They're a majority there, but in the country. Mm -hmm. So you're doing some real interesting, I think, somewhat provocative and seemingly effective work by representing a huge swath, a growing swath of people who, like you, are secular atheists, however they identify like me. And you're saying we have interests. We're good people. And we're going to send you a survey if you want to run for office, and we're going to then endorse you, and it's going to matter. How am I doing describing what you're doing? That's an that's, that's awesome segue, perfect segue into my secular Houston baby. So Houston Oasis, uh, even Houston Atheists, they're not activist groups here in Houston. And I quickly figured out, man, I'm getting more and more political. I think that's going to be a, an efficient way to affect change, both locally and statewide. And, but there was no platform for me to do that. So I made uh, my own group called Secular Houston. And we came about in, two, in December of 2021. And we're not a PAC, we're not a C3, C4, or we're not, none of those things yet. But what we do is, you're right, we send questionnaires to everybody running here locally and some state races. And the, the candidates that return the questionnaire, if they, it aligns with our values, will endorse them and make a list and tell everybody that is listening in our world, hey, we did the work. These people align with our values. Fucking get them elected. And this is how you do that. From easy to hard, there's a whole list of things that you can do, even from afar. You can help from help from afar. And align with our values really means separation of church and state. Number one, number two, number three, that's the, what we, the bell we ring the, the loudest. Respect of science and being okay with non-belief, those are also uh, bonuses. But these candidates now know there is an electorate. There are people that care about these things that are secular, and we normalize secularism locally, statewide. And yes, we've been, since our inception, since we started this, we've been having a lot of success 
uh, great inertia and we're in a good spot right now. You actually said we've been having a lot of sex, which I think would be a real bonus. I've got a siren. I think I'll edit the whole thing out or keep it in. The Johnson Amendment. What's that? <laughs> the Johnson Amendment. I don't get that joke, but it's something to do with <laughs> that's that's it. That's, uh, politics. Uh, anyway. uh, so Secular Houston, by the way, you can follow on Facebook, TikTok, and Twitter, I believe. How is it going? What has the response been like? How, are, are you growing? I, I can imagine a lot of people listening to this and wanting to either join you or join similar groups to be on a similar journey that are listening to this right now. But how, how are you doing? Are you growing? Are you making change? Absolutely growing. Absolutely making change. We Candidates will email us. Hey, y'all are guys are great. How can we get your endorsement? Huh. You're getting some of that in reverse, but then the people that we do send the questionnaires out to, they'll return it with a note saying, y'all look great. So there's an appetite for this. And I want to grow it as much as possible to make the endorsement from Secular Houston worth it. And so I can say that it's worth it now, but I want to continue on that success. What, when you getting back to separation of church and state, let's talk about exactly what we're talking about. You're talking about what kind of candidates, what kind of races that you're endorsing? When does church and state come into these issues at the town council, the school board, and other local races? So that's a whole other episode. And this is where we start talking about Christian nationalism, which I am so glad that you keep bringing that word up. I think I get frustrated when I find someone who's a prominent, respected expert or scholar that I haven't interviewed yet, because I feel like I've been talking to these folks for the last decade, and it's only become obviously a lot worse, the issue. So I'm, I'm, I think it's the most important. It's the greatest threat to everything, really. So go ahead, your thoughts on it. I know that kind of brought you to me, and then I, I keep beating that drum as important to you as it is to me. It is, and it's insidious. They thrive in the shadows. Like Christian nationalism has always been around in America. It's just really accelerated since the the right the revolution of the was it the right the, the religious right in the seventies eighties yeah and it is a hot topic now they are they are laying on a mountain of money and they've accumulated this power over the years so Christian nationalism basically it's a veneer it, it makes all the bullshit that they're trying to pass which otherwise would be unpal uh, people don't like it these bills the Ten Commandments bills voucher bills. They're not popular, but you wrap it in this veneer of respectability, which is Christian nationalism, God, Jesus, and and your pastor. And all of a sudden you get way more success. And this is something that they've been working on for decades and they've gotten pretty good at it, Uh, but it's insidious. So any spotlight on this really helps to weaken them, I think. And that's going to, that's more and more that's been my role is to educate people on what Christian nationalism is. So thank you for doing just the exactly the same thing. Uh, don't you think that so much of it can be encompassed by God, guns, and gays? Meaning so many of the initiatives and so many of the, the campaigns that they're behind have to do with reinterpretation of the Second Amendment and putting taking the rights that gay uh, and lesbian Americans have won and taking them from them. Uh, obviously, the trans issue, like, mm-hmm. and of course, uh, abortion and, and reproductive rights, and we can get on to just gender equity in general, so much of it seems like that, like they almost overwhelmingly believe in those things or those issues that I just mentioned are the most motivating forces. Am I missing anything? What, what else do you think is, am I missing in that description? Uh, the black and brown people is going to be the thing that pervades this from the, from before America was America, the racial and uh, ethnic lines were drawn. And if you're on one side of that line, you have the power, you have you're on top of the hierarchy. And if you're on the other side, you, you stay in your place. So that's the only thing you missed. But otherwise, well, you're, you're a, over, it would seem that overwhelmingly black and brown people are, number one, they're more religious than they're, than a lot of other minorities or I guess the white counterparts in America. But more importantly, they don't really identify as Christian nationalists, although there are increasing numbers supporting Trump and the MAGA movement, as many of them actually literally worship the guy like he is God. What would you say about black and brown communities in America? Obviously not monolithic. I'm having a huge generalized conversation, but in terms of how they identify or how they see 
the Christian nationalist threat, if at all. I think a lot of people, yeah, but it's there. The black and brown people that see it as a threat, it's like, well, throw on the pile of the threats that we've had for uh, multiple generations. The Christian nationalism is not only promoting whiteness in the hierarchy, it's actually, it's also promoting the promise of whiteness. So that's what kind of gets the black and brown people to come on in. And yeah, I'm hanging out with Proud Boys and racist, but it's the promise of being on the right side of this hierarchy line. What do you say? Uh, and I'm not generalizing. I'm not saying that's everybody, but that's one thing that makes me less frustrated. Oh, I think that's a, you're pointing to a, a obviously a really insidious issue. What do you, what role do you think Donald Trump plays in all of this, or is he just just got on the train and, and hijacked it? Yeah, he's yeah he's not Christian nationalism and th- that movement was had was getting more popular before him. He's a symptom of a deeper disease in this nation. So when he goes away, there's still going to be that disease underneath. So yeah, personally, he's charismatic. He gives people what they've been looking for. And again, that's a whole other show. Yeah, we should do uh, all these whole other shows regularly. I'm loving I'm loving talking to you. What are some of the wins that you guys have had in your organization, whether they be large or small or what's the how do we copy what you're doing secular houston we've been we have an endorsement list every election and some candidates win obviously some lose but the ones that win they get into office and they remember who we are we had three city council members win here in houston in the fall and one of them invited us me to give an invocation to the houston city council huge. This is a big deal. Now I get to go up there next month, give a quick humanist invocation, and they know we exist. Uh, People know that we exist. So being out there, being visible is a big win. And even the people, the candidates that do not win, they are usually plugged in to a lot of different groups and people. They're this charismatic types and plugged in. So they know who we are. And so with time, more and more people are going to know who we we are in the the Houston area and in in, in Texas as well. Is it fair to say that you have uh, very similar interests as a lot of progressive Christians or uh, other religious Americans who identify as progressive when it comes to policy? And there are a lot of very religious people who absolutely believe in the separation of church and state for goodness for goodness sake, for their own interest. So some other religion doesn't take over their school, et cetera. So you can't put the satanic verses up in the uh, in, in the auditorium or in the school or on the state grounds and so on. Like separation of church and state is a good thing. A lot of religious people believe. How much overlap is there? How much are you working with progressive religious communities? You're good, man. You're really good. About a little over a year, I've, we've had a big interfaith push, both locally and actually state and nationally. We've made coalitions with uh, groups, progressive Christian, progressive Muslim groups, just interfaith groups, they call themselves. And you're exactly right. They are repulsed by everything Christian nationalism brings to the table. They are repulsed by the oppression they see in the twisting of what they consider the twisting of their faith. And it has been an easy coalition because we have so much in common and they're, they don't recoil. They want us at the table, us being atheists, agnostics, non-believers, secular. They want the secular voice at the table to round out this interfaith moniker that they have. And it's been a joy. And it, it's actually, I learned so much and I, I've been super impressed with most, if not all of the people I've met in the interfaith world because they've been doing the work on the ground way longer than we have and better, I would say, than we have. So they're doing the work. So <laughs> we have so much to learn from them and they are happy to teach us. It's, 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 it's brought me so much joy. That's great. And that's great advice for similar communities and movements around the country listening. What would you say if people want to get involved? They want to contact you. They can email you. They can learn more. They can support your organization. What else, Will, before we leave on the activism? SecularHouston.com is the easiest way, and I'll do my best to help out. Obviously, it, it depends on where you live, but I will, I will do my best to plug you in. Yeah, it's really, it's, it's really shitty out there. It's a lot of disappointment and a lot of bullshit. If you are part of a grassroots movement, all you need to do is do a little bit of something, and that's where I come in. I, I direct people to focus that energy 
into whatever your passion is, is LGBTQ stuff or reaper rights. There's a huge list of things, but I can hopefully point you in the right direction. You put a little bit of energy into that and you've done your little grassroots part. And that's, and it makes you feel good to be able to help. Uh, you, things aren't as shitty. Uh, you, yep. you sleep a little bit better at night and it's a platform to affect change. And that's why I'm here is I want to let people know that is an option. And, uh, and I'll do my best to plug you in so that you uh, can affect change that way. We're so glad to have you part of our community and uh, being a new uh, a newer guy. How have you found it? You've joined us at a lot of hangouts and I wonder how, how you found our community because we're psyched and, and feel real lucky to have you. Oh, I love it, man. I saw you on one of my favorite podcasts, Unreasonable. And so I instantly I went to your Patreon, became a member, and that's how I started hanging out with y'all. You, you, I love your community. It's, it's great. I can't make it every week, but when I do, I actually look forward to it every week. So it's been, it's been terrific. That's awesome. And actually, I'm feeling, I'm, this whole time, I'm feeling not bad, but nervous because one of my man crush, I just have a man crush on two people. And uh, Tim Wise is one of them. So I'm like, oh, I'm in the same chair as Tim Wise. This is, uh, <laughs> this is great. Uh, that's uh, a lot of people feel similarly. And, and as do I. I hold him <laughs> obviously in high regard. He's become a good friend of mine. And I'm psyched that, to hear that you like him and his work. He's simply the best. Let me just ask you this before you go. You helped treat me the other night. On Friday night, I texted you when I was having my tummy ache. And I was re- very grateful that you got back to me. And I, I, I felt terrible about it because I know enough. I got enough doctor friends. You get those texts and calls probably way too often. How do you definitely handle people texting you a symptom about themselves or their child? Isn't that one of the modern hazards of being a physician, much less a nurse or any healthcare, EMT, whatever? Like how many calls and texts do you get from assholes like me? <laughs> I don't get that many anymore. It used to be a lot. Now it hasn't been a lot. There's a short list of people, which you're on. It doesn't bother me at all, man. It's just hard to help from afar. Like you can, I can't do a proper exam. So it, it's hard. I don't want to do any harm. It's tough for me because I am, I may not be given the best advice because I have incomplete information. But yeah, like I told you in the text, if it's 10 out of 10 pain, that's pretty much abdominal pain. Probably much, pretty much going to be an ER visit. Yeah, you sent me to the ER and I went. And then I got up and walked out because it went away. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm really, I really am glad. It sounds like uh, like gas. Some kind of a bubble traveling through me, right? <laughs> I, I did think it was weird that you asked me to send you three different dick pics right away. What was that? How was that? X, X, Y, and Z axes. (laughs) (laughs) I did not do anything at all. I was the one who was audacious and impolite. I can't thank you enough for that. I really appreciated that and appreciate you joining me today. Excited to see what else happens with your work and help promote it and be a part of it. We're, we feel real lucky to have you as part of our community. Thank you for talking to me, man. I really appreciate it. Let's do it again. Absolutely. All right. There he goes. SecularHouston.org. Go check them out and go follow Will on all the social media and uh, check him out on hopefully he'll join us at our hangout on Thursday night and you can ask him more questions and become uh, better friends with him as I have. He's been uh, awesome, just awesome. I love that conversation. I hope you did too. If you want to be on the show, if you have something to offer, if you're doing some activism, if you're part of a campaign, or if you just want to refer me to somebody else, reach out, standupwithpete at gmail.com. Let me know who you want to hear. As always, John Carroll has won two Grammys, no Emmys, two Grammys, no Emmys. I did it again, though, apparently. And every day, I think I, I always just call them Emmys. It's a brain thing. I'm, my brain is broken. We love you, John Carroll. And go buy this song, johncarroll.org, right now. I'll talk to you tomorrow, Bumblebees. Got the creek, he needs you, got to stand up. Stand up. I think you're driving wheels, been leaking grease. Boy, you better stand up. Stand up. Well, there's a whole lot more of us who know us right. They'll keep right on ignoring us if we keep sitting tight.
Listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide. It says stand. 